Welcome back to another episode of 2DW. It's your host here, Shanae. And I'm the other host, Nabella. We want to wish you a happy new year. And we're going to be talking about mental health addiction as well as how it is seen in the black community. We also have a guest for you guys today, so make sure you stay tuned. Come back. Welcome back to Vine Family. So like we said earlier, before we went to break, we have a special guest. Today's episode is about mental health, um, su substance abuse, and how it affects the black community. Um, so I'm going to introduce him now. We have with us Mr. Luke Hamilton. Welcome, welcome. Glad to be here. <laughs> how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Good, good, good. So, Shanae, uh, today's topic is mental health, and that is like... That could be as broad, that could kind of be as small. You kind of, kind it's, of, no, it's pretty broad. <laughs> it's a pretty broad topic. We're not going to downplay that. Um, before this episode starts, I want to say that I'm not a mental health professional. So I'm going to be answering questions based off of my knowledge, and I'm going to be providing stats to back that up, because it's important with topics like this to be as honest and objective as possible, because we don't want to spread false information or make certain people look bad. Very true. Very true. OK, so mental health. Okay, I'm going to leave with this. When you think of that, what's the first thing that pops to your mind? Uh, someone who's struggling with emotional issues or someone who has a hard time coping with certain challenges. Maybe they have chemical imbalances. Maybe they have a genetic predisposition to specific addictions. Or maybe they just have maladaptive coping mechanisms that make them act in certain compulsive ways. What do you think? Oh wow, that yes. was a lot. Luke? I agree it was a lot. I was I was gonna say um that it's just basically how someone feels. Mm. Okay. Me, I'm the clown of the group, as I know. When I think mental health, I think of because it's been conditioned to where black people don't really wanna associate themselves with mental health. If you get my drift, it's like they put it in as jokes in movies, like, okay, mental health, be crazy. That's for white people, you know, like, black people can't be crazy or, or what have you. But that's really not the case because whether you're black, white, male or female, you are human first. And we all have, have feelings and different emotions that could weigh on your mental health. So I do want to get into, okay. Well, before we transition, I wanted to add to, mm -hmm. People can be seemingly what society would call normal or mentally stable for a very long time, but something can, I don't want to use the word trigger, it's overused, but something can offset some type of an imbalance for that person to have, to have an aversion or have uh, mental health challenges. So COVID, for example, a lot of people globally, we've been seeing a lot of challenges with COVID-19 in terms of how people have been feeling stressed or people have been feeling depressed, especially with job loss and families being, um, just compromised where some people are having to work, some people work in hospitals. And with everything going on with COVID, um, they have now been increases in depression, anxiety, as well as substance abuse throughout many communities. So this is exactly why it's very important, especially this time of year, to make sure that you pay attention to your loved ones. If they're isolating themselves, if they're drinking more, if they have any type of substance abuse um, behaviors that are worsening, even if they are taking new medications, you want to make sure that that you are connecting with them in a way that's very helpful because that can signal a potential substance abuse disorder and can also have an underlying um, mental health telltale sign that may, that person may need to get help with somebody. So that's just a note, you guys. Hmm. And that's crazy because I don't know if you guys noticed it in your area when that, when that started, they were saying that how um, they were closing down different stores, but the liquor store was still open. Like people were still going to the liquor store to, you know, get bread and get liquor. And it's like, okay, quarantine party. It's like, okay, the liquor is for what? Some people are using it for substance abuse. Some people are actually just want to have fun. Some people it. are probably stressed, and they, they, that, that's like their most. Um, that's their go-to, like, I'm going to get me some liquor. That's I'm having a hard cope, day. Right. And a lot of people do that. It's very, very easy because when you think about it, alcohol is. It's everywhere, you know, there's so much money that's being made with alcohol sales and 
alcohol, even though we know that it's a lot of fun to drink sometimes, it does so much damage to your body and it's quickly, it's one of the most poisonous, deadliest drugs that a lot of people don't think that, but it's, it can change your brain composition, it can erode your internal organs, it can cause a lot of heavy duty stuff. And because it's everywhere, a lot of people don't think that it's that, that dangerous, which is exactly why it's very important to think about where you are mentally and emotionally when you are drinking and make sure that you can self-moderate. Mm. Okay. So, okay, Dr. Shanai. Um, so, you would say that people would rather drink than talk about a feeling that they're going through, their mental. I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with how people are brought up. Would you say, would you say so? I mean, do you feel like... I think people um, definitely would rather drink sometimes. Um, you know, it all you know, depends on the person, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of people um, sometimes will drink instead of actually just talking about their problems. Um, you know, whether it's to a friend or um, hopping on the phone, you know, talk to someone. Um, you know, a lot of people, they feel like they can just handle things on their own. And that's like, you know, the big like stigma of the black community. It's like, I got it. I, I'll be all right. I, ain't, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I, I'll be okay. I got it. You know, and, you know, either they'll just try to figure it out mentally or, you know, they'll use substance abuse, substance mm -hmm. abuse with uh, alcohol and, you know, other things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you said a word that kind of honed in on, I got it, I'm strong. And that kind of brings me to ask you the question, when you were a kid, were you taught to, if some, if you get hurt, don't cry because you're a big boy, you got it. Like, that feeling of me wanting to be sad for these few seconds and I want to get through this emotion, nip that in the bud, stop crying. Like, did you go through that as a kid? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's one of those uh, societal things that, you know, I guess young boys go through. Um, and, you know, we're just taught to not cry, be a big boy, you know, suck it up. Um, Things that nature. We're not actually able to like tap into our feelings, mm. tap into our emotions. We're just kind of just taught to just shrug them to the side and you know um, be a man. Um, F I. <laughs> Toxic masculinity <laughs> is real. Five, it's real. Um, you know, and there's a quote by uh, Frederick Douglass. Uh, you know, build strong children so that you know you don't have to repair broken men, but. You know, a lot of people, they really like sleep on that quote because nobody's really like using it um, because building up your emotional health is a part of building up a strong child. You know, um, you can teach them all type of stuff, you know, but mm -hmm. your emotional health and, you know, mental health, self-love, all of that kind of stuff is very important at a young age because, you know, by the time you get to college and, and further in life, you'll just already kind of have it in your head, you know, mentally, um, how you should handle certain problems. Mm. Before we, we continue, I, that quote was really profound. I would love for you to repeat it just so everybody can get it. Um, what were you saying the quote was? I believe <laughs> um, it's better to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. That's, that's, and that really shows how a lot of it starts from childhood and what our family members are instilling into us. Because I think some people may think, oh, if, you're, if, you're, if your child is crying, instead of giving it the validation of being emotional, some, some parents would say, stop crying, what are you crying for? And that takes away from the child's ability to be emotionally expressive mm -hmm. or even feel safe expressing or feeling what they feel. And when you have that mentality, you can disregard your own emotions and into adulthood, you're not as emotionally available or expressive because you've been taught to suppress your emotions and to act as if having them is a problem. And so sometimes that conditioning can follow not just into black communities, but also, you know, there's some, there's some Spanish people who go through that, Asian people who go through that. And I think- If you're human, you go through it. Well, not necessarily, because I think some other groups of people have parents who are emotionally available, who don't tell them to dismiss their own emotions because they have to be strong and they have to be um, authoritative and in control. But I do think with certain ethnicities of color, um, especially where you have to be strong and you have to be rational and you, and you can't seem out of order, it's kind of instilled that you have to kind of disassociate with your own emotions. So that's sometimes, in, in my opinion, I think it can be very damaging because again, you're not able to validate your emotions and feel them. So what, what, have, what have you dealt with in terms of, if you're comfortable saying that, what challenges have you gone through in terms of mental health or having to deal with stressful situations in a way that was very positive and healthy? 
you can choose whatever you feel comfortable with. I don't want you to feel, you know. I mean, I was actually going to chime into something else um, based on what you were talking about earlier oh, about uh, being strong. Um, I saw on um, TikTok the other day there was a, a um, white doctor. She was talking about how black people have the strongest skin um, compared to any other race because of you know all the things that we've been through, um, and that's probably maybe a reason why. You know, we kind of just have that about us where we kind of just like, oh, I got it, you know, and I'll be okay, you know, because we've already like gone through so much just trying to, you know, live in a place that we didn't even want to come to, mm -hmm. you know. But. Very true. I do believe that that stems back to slavery. Like, like the doctor said that we had the toughest skin. It was said that back in slavery, um, it was known or taught that slaves couldn't, um, they weren't sophisticated enough to be able to feel emotions. So you're not going to need um, a doctor to talk about because you're not sophisticated, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated enough to do that. Like you don't know anything, like just pick my cut and you do, whatever feelings you have are basically dismissed. And I felt that I know our answers were like, you know, something's not right, but you know what, I'm going to chalk it up to being tired, you know, and then as generation after generation is like, okay, you know what? I'm, I don't feel right. No, you're just tired, you're just stressed. And then now, now it's conditioned to say, you know what? You don't need to talk to anybody. You just need to keep going and just keep pushing. And that's what I think is not what now today's society is, so. I remember when I was a kid, um, I used to uh, talk to my aunt sometimes and I'd tell her like, I'm tired or whatever. And she'd always have the same comeback. Um, and, Say, uh, you're not tired. You don't know what tired is. Mm. You ain't, you ain't, you ain't, you ain't working a forty hour week. What you, what you know about being tired? <laughs> yeah, I heard that line. That's before. true. That's true. No, but the the comment that you mentioned about doctors saying that black patients have tougher skin, it makes me think of an article I read where um, black patients were discriminated against when it came to pain medications because a doctors believed that they didn't feel as much pain as white counterparts. So you had black patients, imagine this, you're a black patient, you had a car accident. You might have torn several muscles or you're having a lot of swelling and bleeding and the doctor's like, oh, you're black, you don't need the same milligrams of this drug that the white patient gets because you're stronger. Or secondly, wow. they think that if they give black patients um, the same amount of medications that they give other races, the black patient is going to sell it. So that just shows you the systemic racism that does occur in the medical facility. And if black people know that, because maybe their black friend told them that who was in the hospital, you think that they're gonna go and get help from a therapist? No, especially if the therapist is not even black and has no cultural awareness about what black people go through. Well, because you have black friends does not mean that you are socially aware and cultural enough to understand what, it, what a black person goes through. So when someone is not black and they're trying to help you through your issues, you as a black person want somebody who has been in the struggle. You don't want somebody who's going to tell you, oh, you're fine. No, I'm not fine. I need somebody black to understand. So sometimes, in my opinion, that creates, just just my perception, that may keep people from going to certain therapists. And I think that, and I'm sure that there are a lot of black therapists out there, but I think that um, black therapists should be pushed out more because sometimes black people don't know that they have that as an option. Very true. So y'all, we're gonna wrap this up, but we're gonna come back and we're gonna get more into this. So make sure you guys stay tuned, all right? Welcome back. So I'm going to lead in with some stats about mental health in the black community. And this is coming from Mental Health America. So just a few things here. Um, the prevalence is black and African-American people living below the poverty line are twice as likely to report serious psychological distress than those living twice above poverty level. Mm -hmm. Secondly, 
Adult blacks and African Americans are more likely to have feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and worthlessness than adult whites. And we know that comes from slavery as well as other factors that we've had to deal with culturally. Um, blacks and African Americans are less likely than white people to die from suicide at old ages. However, black and African American teenagers are more likely to attempt suicide than white teenagers. And that's 9.8% versus 6.1%. So just a few more here. Serious mental illness rose among all ages of black and African American people between 2008 to 2018, so 10 years. 16%, and that's 4.8 million, of black and African American people reported having a mental illness, and 22.4% of those, which is 1.1 million people, reported a serious mental illness over the past year. So it's there, and we see that, um, and we talked about why it was there. And we talked about um, stigmas with therapy and sometimes there being a lack of cultural sensitivity and awareness for what black patients may need because you're not just dealing with race issues, you're also dealing with poverty and feelings of worthiness that comes through as um, for why there might be mental health challenges in the black community as well. Wow, that was a mouthful. Um, I, I had a quick question I want to kind of piggyback off of. You said that the, the, the stats of black people versus white people, um, whatever that, that um, the, what's the word for it? How do I put it? So basically, so basically you said, you said black, black people goes through depression and, and suicidal more so than white people. And I kind of believe that's because when you're younger and you're white, you are allowed to express that emotion. And I kind of think, that's just my opinion, I think that with black people, it's, you can't express it, and then white people, you can express it in over the expression to where you're, now you're entitled, now you're, you've grown up, and now every emotion, if, how to put it, every emotion you feel, if you want to be mad at the, I'm going to say this, you'd be mad at the mailman, now you want to go postal because you were able to express and be overzealous with your emotions. So it's kind of like a, a scale. It's like, like on one end, you yeah. have a lack of expression. On the other end, you have Too much. the entitlement of it. Exactly. So that's how it creates the imbalance. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So, Luke. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as a black male, black man in America, do you, what do you feel about Therapy. Would you recommend, like, if a friend was to come to you and say, hey, dude, I got this thing going on, and it's something that you, as a friend, that probably couldn't, you know, chime in on, you felt that they needed help, would you actually say, hey, bro, or hey, sis, I think you need to go and talk to somebody, or, or kind of, nah, you good? Definitely. I, uh, I actually think everyone should uh, go to counseling. Um, really, no matter what they got going on in life, even if they don't feel like anything is wrong, um, okay. because it just helps you connect the dots on um, so many different levels in your life. And it's really mind blowing um, just to go and just to be able to talk to somebody about life and the things that you have going on. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really uh, mind blowing. Um, I really didn't want to go. Uh, it was actually a friend of mine that suggested that I should go um, when I was going. Um, and I really didn't want to go. I kind of like, you know, just like the stigma of everything was just, um, felt like I would be crazy or whatever. But I ended up going, um, wasn't really taking it serious the first two times or whatever. But after a while, I uh, just kind of felt like I wish, you know, my counselor, I had, I, I wish I had her in my back pocket, you know, because it was um, very enlightening to go with every, every session. Um, it was always something I was learning. Um, and even, you know, towards the end of my um, tenure with her, um, I kind of just wanted to keep going, you know, but, you know, she was kind of telling me like, okay, you're not coming here with problems anymore. You're kind of just coming here to update me on life. And I think you are well enough, you know, able to, you know, handle your problems um, now, you know? She kind of had to tell me to get up out of her office. Oh, so she kind of like became your journal after a while. Yeah, 
Uh, okay, let me tell you about today. Today's yeah, day. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. That's a good thing that you were able to reach that point. And that just shows how valuable it is if you really need it, that it can really help improve your life. So, yeah. Let's make me go to therapy, y'all. Y'all stop telling these babies, stop crying. This is a valid reason. Just saying. Yeah, they should just go. Um, just go. I feel like, you know, um, even like maybe in elementary school, you know, if they have a school counselor, just have your kids just go. It's it's necessary. Not Mr. Mackey. Oh, don't go to Mr. Mackey class. No. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Deal time because sometimes when you have trauma going on at home or you have um, children dealing with changes, like say your parents are getting divorced, it's going to be hard to not reenact that while you're in school. Or if a child is unfortunately getting molested or if a child is going through any type of growth spurts or challenges with fitting in, getting them while they're young, in my perception, is a really good time because it allows them to maybe role play and go, okay, this is why I'm going through this. So say you have a counselor at your school who's trying to connect with the child instead of telling them you should not be feeling like this or teachers who can judge the child because they're just seeing the child on the surface acting up and they're not trying to get to the root of it. While they're young, they can really understand how they're being affected by what's affecting them. And if they have a counselor saying, you're hurting because mommy and daddy are not together anymore and it's okay, I'm here for you. You never know how that can impact them. This child can grow up 30 years from that point and realize, oh, that counselor was there for me and it made me realize that I had other people outside of my parents that I can turn to when I was going through something. So I think that's a great point. And that brings it back to the quote he said earlier, build strong children so you don't have to repair broken men, mm -hmm. or women for that matter. Um, so that's actually a really good point you have. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. I'll do a little oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we talked about the stats, we talked about, we got the male's point of view that it's okay to go to therapy. What else would you say that we could tell the people? Like, I don't know, what do you think? I would say Yes, alcohol is good. It's good. I know it is. But don't drown yourself in it. That's right. And especially as New Year's, like, talk to somebody. You know, it's, even if you have to first write it down and then get to a counselor or whatever, and it's okay, this is what I was feeling or thinking, such and such. Talk to somebody because you never know what good it can do. Mm -hmm. Alcohol can only do the opposite if you're using it for the wrong reason, if, if you guys get my drift. Right. I also think that if you're struggling with something emotionally, do not be afraid to reach out to your community. I know a lot of black people do like to go to their churches and other institutions that have been safe for them. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, your relatives, if you can find a friend, if you can find a support group, if you are struggling with something, don't be too strong to say that I need help because a lot of times admitting that you have a problem or you need help is actually the first step that you can take to progressing in a certain situation. It does not make you weak, it makes you human. So don't be afraid to do that. Well, this has been a mouthful. Um, Luke, do you have anything you wanna add on before we go ahead and get out of here? Sure thing. Um, actually, um, I think that even if you feel like you don't need counseling, um, I actually challenge everybody watching to just go to counseling. Just, just go, just go, and tell the counselor everything. You know, tell them everything, and just see where things go. I like that, I like that, Luke. So y'all, y'all hear this, this awesome challenge, right? So where could they find you so they can say, "Hey, Luke." I did it. Like, where can I find you? Definitely. I would actually love that if uh, everybody watching, you know, kind of just comes in and just lets me know, hey, I accepted the challenge. I did it. You know, that would be, uh, that would mean a lot to me. Really. Um, but everybody can follow me um, on Instagram and TikTok at underscore Luke Hamilton underscore. Facts. Well, I think my closing thoughts is that, like Luke said, Go if you need it, also if you don't need it, but go. Don't bury yourself in, in alcohol, even though it's it's really, really good. But use it for its intended purpose. You know, if you if you're upset, don't go and drink. Talk about why you're upset. Get that emotion out because it's just only gonna fester and it's just going to blow over and not be good at the end. 
Um, also, journaling is a good thing. I, I'm a writer, so I, I can write a whole notebook until my hand falls off. And that's another way of you letting out that emotion. Once you wrote it, wrote it down, now, okay, that's, hey, so what are we doing now? Because you got it out of your system, you know what I mean? So there are different methods, different strokes for different folks. I would just say just use, do what works best for you so that way you can become the best person or best version of yourself. Um, well, this has been a great episode, guys. I really, really enjoyed it. Like, the conversation was really, really good. I do want to wish you guys a happy new year and be safe. Hopefully 2021 is coming here. Just sit down. Just <sighs> all I want to say. So, make sure you have a happy new year. <laughs> and if anybody you know is struggling with addiction, rehab is out there. Make sure that they can get help as well. Definitely advocate for that if necessary. You want to say bye, Luke? See you all later. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>